All right, hello everyone and welcome. I am uh, Dr. Laura Heffernan. I'm an associate professor in the English department at the University of North Florida and one of the co-founders of this series, The Justice Sessions, which we have been running since August of 2020. It's a series that is explicitly focused on Jacksonville and the history of racial injustice in Jacksonville, the future of racial justice in Jacksonville. Uh, we've had many great uh, sessions in this series for the last couple of years, and most of them are recorded and up on our website. So I will put the link to that website um, in the chat here um, so that you can all access it. A couple of housekeeping things. So um, we are going to have a panel discussion today. You, um, there is a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen that you should feel free to use. Um, you can submit your questions as the panelists are speaking, and then the moderator will be able to see what's queued up there and to guide Q&A towards the end of the hour. We're going to be meeting for one hour today, um, and we'll probably have about 15 or 20 minutes of Q&A at the end. So, and then you can use the chat to just express, you know, exclamations, general enthusiasms, things like that. Uh, we'll all be able to see it. So there's a couple of uh, two more justice sessions coming up in spring 2022 semester um, that I wanted to mention. The next one will be on Tuesday, April 26th. Um, this is also going to be a roundtable event titled Africana Studies, Digital Humanities and Applied Interdisciplinarity at UNF. Um, the registration link for that session is on the Justice Sessions website that I will share in the chat. Um, and then on Wednesday, May 4th, we're going to have an in-person event. Um, one of our first, or our, only our second, I think we, we did a, a talk with Disha Filia in the, in the fall that was in person. This will be our second one. It's going to be held at the Jacksonville Main Library. It's a crossover event with our sister series, the Baobab Literary Arts. Um, and that is going to be on Wednesday, May 4th from 6 to 8 p.m. It's a poetry reading um, featuring some of Jacksonville's most exciting voices and hosted by our own Mark Ari. So uh, I am really excited about our, oh, Dr. Leverett is in the chat saying, no, no, it was going to be at MOCA now. So uh, just right next door to the main library at MOCA. So we'll fix that on the website. Um, I am really excited about our panel discussion here today. Um, the topic is how we teach Jacksonville history now. I know that some of the attendees are here from the DCPS Task Force on African American History. Welcome, so happy to have you. Um, thanks everyone for coming and let me introduce our, our speakers and our moderator and then I will disappear. So first is Scott Matthews. Um, Dr. Matthews is a professor of history at Florida State College at Jacksonville. He received his PhD in American history from the University of Virginia. His first book, Capturing the South, Imagining America's Most Documented Region, examines the history of documentary work about the American South during the 20th century and is a very interesting book that I'm currently reading. Um, and then Jennifer Gray is born and raised in Jacksonville. She graduated from UNF. Um, and received her um, Master's of Science and in Information from Florida State University. She currently serves as the Public Services Coordinator for FSCJ's Library and Learning Commons, where she oversees the college archives and digs up a lot of really interesting primary materials related to Jacksonville history. Alan Bliss is Executive Director of the Jacksonville Historical Society. He holds, holds a PhD in history from the University of Florida, and he teaches courses at UNF on urban history, maritime history, and a seminar on public history, all emphasizing Jacksonville. And then our moderator today is um, Professor David Scheffler, chair of the history department here at UNF. He teaches courses in medieval and world history. Uh, his research interests include late medieval universities and pre-university education. He is the author of Schools and Schooling in Late Medieval Germany. Um, and he is currently working on a scholarly biography of the Augustinian hermit, theology professor, and anti-Hussite preacher, Berthold Huchhauser. So thanks so much to all of our, um, all of our speakers today, and um, I will hand things over to Dr. Scheffler. Thank you, Dr. Heffernan. Uh, so today's topic, as, as, as you all know, uh, is how we teach Jacksonville history now. Um, and because, as, as many of you are aware, uh, there is a lot of material now that's available uh, to students and, uh, and, and to teachers to convey and to explore aspects of Jacksonville's history. I wanna start 
with the now part of that that uh, question. How are we teaching it now? Um, and if if you'd like to volunteer, ways in which um, uh, what what has changed in your approaches to teaching this topic in recent years, and also uh, just as importantly, what primary materials are available now or accessible that weren't um, uh, relatively uh, recently. So. Uh, anybody want to sort of take that question, how do you teach it now? And, and then talk about some of the types of materials that both teachers and students might have access to now related to the history of Jacksonville. Well, um, I, will, I will start. And I came, when I came to FSCJ in 2015, <clears throat> I came in part because I was very eager to be back home in Jacksonville and to teach American history um, in the community where I grew up. And I knew when I got here that I wanted to some way, I knew the courses I'd be teaching and I knew I'd be teaching primarily the US history survey. And um, I knew that because that I would be located at the downtown campus and have easy access to the library, um, the Jacksonville Historical Society and, and important historical sites nearby. I knew I wanted to try to integrate Jacksonville history or use Jacksonville history as a window into broader national and global themes. And in fact, I remember when I gave my job talk at FSCJ um, that I was asked to speak on reconstruction and its relevance. And um, I chose a kind of Jacksonville history topic about the, the fight for control of Bethel Baptist Church during Reconstruction, the resulting split that occurred between its Black members and its white members, and used the kind of geography of downtown, how Bethel Baptist is now located to the north of the downtown campus, First Baptist to the south, and emphasizing that was a byproduct of, of Reconstruction fights. And so for me, at first, teaching Jacksonville history was finding those kind of signal moments and using them again to explore broader topics and themes such as reconstruction. And until Jennifer and I began to think about creating a course totally dedicated to Jacksonville history, I as a teacher mostly was relying on um, secondary scholarship, um, whether it was Jim Crooks's books, um, Daniel Schaefer's books. Um, uh, yeah, I'm blanking on the author to render invisible about the, the politics of black political engagement post civil that's, that's, war. Uh, Robert Castanello. Yes, Robert Castanello. Thank you, Alan. Um, and so for me, this new opportunity to create a Jacksonville history course and having Jennifer be such an extraordinary researcher is an opportunity to rethink how we use primary sources and um, increasingly because of Jennifer's work and the research she has been doing I have begun to integrate more and more primary source material into our class and I'm sure I can and Jennifer can talk more about that later so for me it's gone the trajectory of being familiar with the secondary literature and integrating that to how I teach but emphasizing now more and more and then far more intentionally in the Jacksonville history course to come using primary sources and then introducing students to doing research in local institutions. I think Dr. Matthews has hit on one of the key points that can make teaching Jacksonville history more valuable in the curriculum at every level of education, and that is by connecting the broader themes of U.S. history into the Jacksonville experience. And my experience of, of teaching various courses uh, here and here at UNF and elsewhere is that Jacksonville is really a great city in which to connect the broad themes of US history with the lived experience of people who have been here. Um, the city is, as I think most people have become increasingly aware now, in its 200th year of existence. We have a broad arc of history in this city. We also have had uh, a remarkable convergence of communities, people from uh, from backgrounds that are diverse, not just racially and ethnically uh, and geographically, and uh, the political and ethnic and socioeconomic and racial diversity of Jacksonville continues to uh, surprise and impress me. It no longer surprises me so much, but it impresses me. And 
I think Jacksonville is is misread by people who are not so familiar with it as a place that is uh, culturally uh, homogenous and ideologically sort of uh, retrograde, I think, in the, in the imagination of many who haven't experienced it. And so people who, ex who do come here and experience it, uh, I have observed generally tend to be surprised by those things. Dr. Matthews mentioned uh, inspiring uh, students and scholars of Jacksonville history to become more engaged with primary sources. And of course, that is, uh, that's the bread and butter of uh, practicing historians. There is nothing so satisfying, is there, in what we do as getting into the archives and reading the old mail and uh, using those, uh, those records, those resources as a way to turn the telescope of time around and look back through the wide end and, uh, and try to catch a glimpse of people in the past. Uh, one of the principal avenues of primary source research that I think still has uh, a tremendous amount of potential to be exploited is church archives and church records. Dr. Matthews mentioned Bethel, uh, Jacksonville's oldest church, and the one that I think does a better job, has long done a better job than any church in Jacksonville. Black, white, ethnic, no matter what denomination, Bethel has been uh, meticulously faithful to its uh, preservation impulse, and that's owing in large part to one of the giants of church history in Jacksonville, the late Camilla Thompson, who's passing, I, I lament, but she, she has left a tremendous body of work on which people can stand coming after her. But just think, she curated such a great uh, archive for that impressive and important church, but every church has an archive. Sometimes it may be as small as one or two file cabinets in a church office someplace, uh, but it's not just the records of the church. The church is the people who experience its life, and they leave all manner of evidence about their experience, their families, their relationships, the big changes that go on in life, the casual letters between parishioners and the church leadership and vice versa, all of those documents, if they have been uh, conserved, if not preserved, uh, I think that's a, a tremendous wealth of information for, for all of us. And not to monopolize this thread for too much longer, but I want to point out what I think is a missing gap. And Dr. Matthews, again, has made reference to our colleague, James Crooks, who has published uh, among the relatively few so far scholarly works of history on Jacksonville. And his two big works uh, concentrate on Jacksonville after the fire. That's the chronology from 1901 until about 1920. And then his work from consolidation to the Jaguars, which covers from the 1960s until the 1990s. There is a huge missing gap. And Jim and I have discussed the urgency of trying to fill that in. Uh, on the one hand, it's too bad it, that it hasn't been filled in yet. On the other hand, uh, the resources that we can use to document that period uh, continue to tumble out and grow. And I'm talking about the period of the 1920s through the 1950s, especially the interwar years. And we've been excited to collaborate with UNF on, uh, on digitizing and making more widely accessible a critical collection from Jacksonville during the Great Depression on that. So I'll pause with those thoughts, uh, but. So I'm gonna go ahead and pick up on something uh, Dr. Bliss said. And uh, while when we got into this project and Scott and I have been sort of working on this history of Jacksonville class for a couple of years now, what I thought I would be doing uh, to help Dr. Matthews was exactly what Dr. Bliss said, which is going to archives and digging through, you know, old letters and pieces of paper and really getting to, to smell the history and be surrounded by it. Uh, and then we were getting ready to start that and it was March, 2020 and that completely went out of the window. So every every sort of on-site visit that I thought I'd be doing, you know, going, going to the JPL and scanning through the microfiche and being able to visit the historical society and spend hours a day there um, was no longer a possibility for us. So that wound up completely not being the type of research uh, that was available to us at the time. So what we had to do instead was sort of pivot to a different approach, which I think in the long run 
it was very educational for me, obviously, and also wound up helping us a lot, which is that because we didn't have access to the major areas, you know, the JPL and JHS, like I said, we had to kind of think out of the box and figure out what might be available online um, that we hadn't touched. Now, obviously, you've got your Library of Congress, you've got your Florida Memory, you've got your Florida Historical Society. Um, but one of the things that I've learned to do throughout this process is remember and focus on Jacksonville as sort of a hub of commerce and tourism and military might and all sorts of different things, and then work my way backward from who might have come through here and where they might have been or where they might have been going, um, and then go to the places where those people were and look in those sources. So, you know, something like the New York Public Library, or even there's some stuff in Los Angeles, or my best example for this is Scott was particularly interested in for some work that I think he was doing with the Equal Justice Initiative. There was a uh, film shot here in 1898, possibly the first film I think shot in the city of Jacksonville, um, which is an execution by hanging, which is just what it sounds like. It's a very brief um, mutoscope film of the execution of a man named Edward Henson. And correct me if I get any of this wrong, if you would, Scott. Um, it was filmed during the Spanish Civil War and there's documentation about that thing, but we were looking to see if the film actually existed. And so we were coming some newspaper archives. We found a reference online in the newspaper archive to a group of soldiers from Racine uh, who had been down and had come and watched the execution. And I backtracked their names to Wisconsin and a veterans center there where they collected some history and we couldn't find the film, but we did find still photos from the actual execution going back. And all of that was only possible because of the sort of growth of the availability of records online. Um, I would say even over the last 10 years, it's probably exponentially grown. And so now it is much more possible for you to backtrace that kind of thing um, and do some historical research that way. And that has been incredibly useful for us as we, as we go through this work. If I could pick up on a point that each of you kind of touched on a little bit, um, the, the place of local history, and I would argue that all historians are ultimately local historians, but um, I know that there tends to be a perception that local history is somehow less than other, I don't know what the other history is, but um, I encountered this quite personally myself um, when I was part of a group on campus that was looking to uh, develop a, a center for the study of Jacksonville in Northeast Florida. And some of the pushback I got was, well, you know, we don't want to just be a local institution. And somehow this is, um, you know, not the, the sort of legitimate kind of history that we ought to be doing. How do you, you, each of you who are sort of engaged very closely in this, and you've hinted at it in your answers, but um, address some of that um, misperception of local history. I mean, everything happened here. It's, it's ridiculous. Every, every famous people came through here. Um, we were making jokes for a while when we were doing, um, Scott and I were do the, doing the reading for the first portion of our course. And it's just like, uh, everybody who was anybody wandered across or through Jacksonville to fight somebody else, especially in the first couple of hundred years. Like, you know, maybe they weren't stopping here necessarily to do anything more than water their horses, but they were on the way to have a major battle from here. And it's because of the centrality of Jacksonville and the St. John's River, more people came through here than you think. So it's easy to think that nothing happened here. And Lord knows that when I was growing up here, you know, no, of course, nothing ever happened in Jacksonville. It's a very boring place. What could have possibly happened here? And the more work we do here, the more that's obviously a fallacy. Like, you know, all the presidents wandered through here, all sorts of different military, what was it? William Jennings Bryan was here with the Spanish-American War or something. It's just ridiculous when you go looking. You know, the Astors had a building down here um, and we're part of the Yacht Club. It's just full of the big names from American history um, who came down here to party or fight or just get away from the snow. And people tend to think we're shunted off to the side and nothing ever happened here. And it's completely, completely incorrect. It's almost, it's almost funny at this point. Yeah, I, Scott, go ahead. I think you were. 
Oh, well, I, I will just say very briefly um, that I agree with everything Jennifer is saying, but I also think when we're thinking about the meaning and, and significance of local history, it's not so much the, the import of what happened in, 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 the, in the outsized personalities who came to town. It's more about how in conveying this to students um, about how history really, really begins with individual decisions and actions. And it, and it radiates beyond the, the, the personal to the local, to the state, to the regional, to the national. And then of course, those global national and state influences um, come in and shape the character of a place. And so, you know, if it's just showing students sort of the, the, the concentric circle model so that they understand their intimate connection to that history. And I do this in other history courses and I, and I wanna really be intentional in a future Jacksonville history course, but getting students to tell me their, as much as they wish to share their personal histories and biographies, why are they in Jacksonville? And then we, oftentimes we'll take those collective stories and then kind of create a history of our community within a class and then say, okay, well, how do these themes then of immigration and migration um, and, you know, or if you're deep rooted in Jacksonville, whatever it might be that we take these personal stories and kind of try to tell a broader history. Um, but also to emphasize to students, um, you know, the rich historiography of of, of cities, you know, I mean, it's some of the most pioneering scholarship in American historiography is, as Alan well knows, is with ur urban history. Um, and so I think the perception is, is that local history is antiquarianism. It's books by, you know, aging white men who tell a story of the leading lights of a community or present the, the history of a town as kind of a cabinet of curiosities. And, are really good at explaining the who, what, and when, but not the how and why questions. Um, and so historically, amateur historians have kind of been the, the energy behind um, local history. And that's those, those books, T. Frederick Davis's book, Pleasant Daniel Gold's book on Duval County and Davis's on Jacksonville, they're fantastic for what they were doing, but they're also, you know, there's clear limitations with those kind of amateur histories. And we don't use them as, you know, these perfect sources, but as sort of windows into the minds of how people thought about a particular place. Um, and so it's getting students to understand the distinction between professional historical work and historiography of local histories that historians can use with caution and exposing them at least um, to different modes of local history and emphasizing its import as we've talked about how the local connects to the global. Uh, like almost everyone else, I think, uh, who has taught certainly at the university and college level, uh, we have exposure to students who come to history with a wide range of levels of interest and engagement and appetite for learning. And uh, we teach courses uh, at the level from the survey all the way through to courses in our area of specialization and uh, craft seminars, that sort of thing, pre-professional uh, courses for the undergraduates. And then, and then there's the graduate range. In my own teaching, I try to smuggle Jacksonville into every curriculum and every course at every level. And this is all a part of the project of engaging students who, as I said, come to us with varying levels of interest. And Jacksonville, yes, it is a coherent, finite, identical place, identifiable place with boundaries, but it's a place where you can teach history. And I just, while Scott was talking, I made a quick list of different themes in broader history that Jacksonville offers a great way to teach. The history of World War II, uh, the history of the civil rights movement, the history of the Civil War. Jacksonville is a great place to complicate people's understanding of the way the Civil War played out in the lived experience of peoples of, of uh, all manner of backgrounds. The history of the New Deal and the Great Depression. Jacksonville is a place that has a tremendous and lively experience of that. 
the history of the Roaring Twenties and, and Prohibition, a, uh, a fascinating and very engaging and appetizing story, uh, especially for a certain uh, subset of college students. And Jacksonville has a lively history there. The history of city planning. How do you make that interesting? Well, that has been a particular challenge for me, and Jacksonville is a great place to teach that story. Uh, the first city in, in, in the state of Florida, one of the first ones in the region to adopt a comprehensive municipal plan. The history of aviation, uh, maritime history. Jacksonville as a seaport and a Navy town is one of the best places I can imagine uh, to offer a course in U.S. maritime history which covers a tremendous amount of the history of this nation from the pre-colonial era right down through the present moment. Uh, those are, I think, some of the ways that local history can be made to take on a pulse and a heartbeat and meaning. And for students at every level, when you can talk about those larger themes in US history and then show people places in their own town, in some cases in their own neighborhood, where aspects of that story, that history have emerged, that's a way that we can help bring it to life. And Jacksonville, like almost every city, is a setting where you can find those interpretations. But I think we're lucky to live in Jacksonville, a place that really has such richness and diversity and scope and scale, where you really don't have to look very far and very hard to find ways to uh, pull those stories out of the experience of the past here. So shifting gears a little, um, this is a particularly, um, I think, or, or, or maybe when you're in it, it always feels particularly fraught. Um, but, but this is a, a fraught moment for the teaching of history in a variety of ways, particularly in the context of um, K through 12 education, um, but also even at the university level. One of those areas where um, some of these conversations are happening, uh, particularly cir circulate around uh, the teaching of uh, uh, issues related to race, uh, to African-American history. Um, as you, um, in, in your courses, um, how do you introduce students um, to Jacksonville African-American history? Um, and what are some of the challenges that you face in researching um, this past uh, and teaching, uh, teaching it in the present? Um, and at this point, I really do want to acknowledge and, and maybe some of the, if there are some teachers in the audience, I know that given some of the recent um, legislation, uh, there's a lot of anxiety about how one can uh, address these kinds of questions uh, in ways that don't um, uh, create the potential for um, legal action. Uh, Dr. Heffernan had noted uh, that in a recent conversation uh, that she had that there was a teacher who expressed almost certainty about the potential for lawsuits um, that might come out of uh, particularly the teaching at the K through 12 level. Um, but with that kind of as background, um, how, how do you approach and introduce students to uh, the teaching of Jacksonville's African American history um, and what specific challenges are associated with getting at the, um, uh, and, the and, and researching this particular past or these pasts? Um, well, I know for my, so at FSCJ, I teach, um, I'm, I'm the only full-time historian or historically have been the only one who's full-time at the downtown campus. So that means I've been teaching since I got here in 2015, both halves of the US History Survey um, both has the African American History Survey, and at, at times I've taught um, Florida history, though not in, in recent semesters. And um, in each of those classes, I've really again the model that I tried to begin at first with my modern American history classes by integrating Jacksonville history. I've, I've tried in each of those other classes to do the same, and so you know just yesterday, um, to give an example, um, in my African American history survey class, which is at FSCJ AMH 2092, which I also had dual enrollment students from Duval County Public Schools um, taking that class with me, who are oftentimes some of my most um, enthusiastic and curious and accomplished of students. 
we were talking about the unique political economy context of slavery in Northeast Florida, um, both during both Spanish periods, during the British period, and then of course in the American um, territorial and state period. And we were, of course, I was drawing from the scholarship of Dan Schaefer, and we were reading and discussing his um, book on Anna Magazine Jai um, Kingsley and talking about how we can understand Kingsley's life and her experiences um, and, and kind of trace her experiences as a kind of global history of slavery itself. And then looking at what made Northeast Florida and Jacksonville unique. Um, and it just, it is an example of how an abstraction for students that it's difficult for them sometimes to place themselves 200 years in the past to kind of truly understand the human dimensions of slavery and being able to tell a personal story and then to have students recognize places that Schaefer mentions in his book. We've mentioned this before. Um, and then, you know, recognizing that along the St. John's River near what is today the campus of JU, there was a large free black community of which Anna Kingsley was in some sense the head of. Um, and so examples like that have been really, really effective. I know, and I'll mention one more example and then open it up to the others. But um, in recent years, I have been a part of the um, Jacksonville Community Remembrance Project, which is associated with the Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery. and. Um, I was invited to be one of the researchers for that project that was designed to document and um, write histories of racial terror lynchings that occurred in Duval County. And in the course of doing that research, um, we have uncovered a number of other lynchings that occurred in Duval County that the EJI did not know about. But it's also been an opportunity for me to do online research into um, a variety of sources that uncover the legacy of racial violence here, but for the, me then to bring those topics into the classroom. Um, for instance, in my modern American history classes or modern African American history classes, we talk about um, how Jim Crow was undergirded by the use of violence. And again, for a lot of students, this is a very delicate and difficult topic. It's also one that for some of my students is an abstraction. It's something that they think they know about and, and, and but oftentimes it's assumed it happened elsewhere. And so bringing in newspaper accounts of that, um, getting students to think about why was it for instance that in Jacksonville, racial terror lynchings began to rise and peak in, from 1909 through the 1920s, a period unlike other places in the South where the peak was in the 1890s. So what's going on in Jacksonville where the peak is later? And so it's a way to talk about a national tragedy in local terms um, while being sure to always humanize it. And one of the things we did with the AJI was to research and David Jameson at Edward Waters helped in this greatly to research um, the individuals to fully flesh out that they weren't just victims, but they were people that they lived in certain neighborhoods in Jacksonville, that they were members of certain organizations in Jacksonville. Um, and David, in fact, has traced ancestors and has done oral histories with them. Um, so it's just, it's been a, for me as a professor, thinking about not just using another example of Jacksonville history that can appear like an abstraction to students even, even though it's local, it's getting them to see how the media covered it, getting them to see individuals as fully fleshed historical actors and not just victims. And then seeing that the descendants are still um, living in this city and their historical memory is as critical to telling these stories as anyone else's. And that's one thing I hope this Jacksonville history course will do that it opens up the narrative, opens up the telling of history, not just to professors, but to community members who have these historical memories and how we bring those into the classroom 
And I think we're only beginning to start to do that. Dr. Matthews is certainly right about the last thing he said, not to suggest he was wrong about anything else, but we're certainly uh, just getting started on our capacity to complicate and, uh, and better represent the story of African-Americans lived experience in Jacksonville. Um, in, teaching, in teaching a course on the, the broad topic of American civil rights history, uh, Jacksonville offers a broad chronological arc, and that's one of the focuses that, uh, that I use in teaching that course. It didn't just start uh, with uh, Rosa Parks uh, refusing to surrender her seat on a bus. Uh, the impulse, the imperative, the movement, and the striving for uh, equal citizenship, equal rights, and justice goes back as far as there has been the United States and beyond. And in Florida and in Jacksonville, we can find evidence of that all along the way, all along this way. And uh, this, is a, this is another example of how you can take away the presumption of victimhood associated with um, the lives of people of color in the United States and give them greater agency. And one of the ways that, um, that we can do that in Jacksonville is point to the example of some of the, the best known African-Americans in the city's past, James Walter Johnson and his brother Rosman, for example, they certainly have enjoyed a much greater profile in public representations of Jacksonville's past in recent years than they did for a long time. And it has been gratifying to see Jacksonville's uh, advocates for, um, for public history and for historical interpretation and representation, give attention to the Johnson brothers. Um, we, we do not do nearly enough with other influential African-Americans whose uh, lives intersected with Jacksonville. And I think probably the greatest, ex greatest example I point to is that of A. Philip Randolph, whose childhood was spent on the east side of Jacksonville. It is, uh, childhood home, the site of his childhood home is just a, uh, a couple of minutes from my office on the east side of Jacksonville. I argue Philip, A. Philip Randolph was one of the giants of U.S. 20th century history, not just civil rights history, uh, but a hugely influential figure. And it's telling, is it not, uh, that as soon as he was able to discern his predicament as a young African-American man in Jacksonville, he left <laughs> and found some other place. Uh, to really give voice to his sense of uh, his mission, the value of his life, and the value of the lives of the people whose background he shared as an African-American man. Um, spreading the chronology of the civil rights movement out, but even if you just bear down hard on the climactic years from the 1950s until the late 1960s, you can find just incredibly vibrant examples of these moments of tension and conflict and awakening. Probably one of the most dramatic is the example of uh, the former federal judge, uh, Brian Simpson, uh, formerly chief judge of the, uh, of the Middle District of Florida, whose uh, division was headquartered here in Jacksonville and who ruled favorably on the lawsuit brought against the city of St. Augustine by the NAACP and the SCLC and found that indeed St. John's County and St. Augustine had behaved inappropriately, had been had acted illegally in preventing public demonstrations. Well, Judge Simpson was a white guy, a Floridian, a native Floridian, uh, and somebody who was as representative of the white civic leadership establishment in Jacksonville as you could find. But for the sin, of ruling favorably on the uh, constitutional challenge brought by the NAACP. Judge Simpson was ostracized by the friends of a lifetime, by the civic clubs uh, that he had belonged to, received death threats. The original letters uh, that came to him are still uh, on file and you can hold them in your hands in the archives at the PK Young Library of Florida History over at the University of Florida. Uh, just being able to share stories like that helps complicate people's understanding and, and brings to life that experience here in Jacksonville. Um, talking about broad stories of Jacksonville history, like 
its maritime industry like the Navy. Uh, Jacksonville is the greatest Navy town in the state of Florida, the largest and most significant, and it's one of the most significant in the country. Well, talking about the Navy is one thing, but talking about the human dimension of it really helps bring to life the fact that the experience of service with the Navy or being related to or connected to or a friend of somebody who served in the Navy, that cuts back and forth across racial and ethnic and socioeconomic backgrounds and in just about every dimension, you can find a Navy story that pertains to Jacksonville that helps complicate people's understanding of uh, the role of individuals. Hope that's spoken a little bit to your question, David. That was a good one. Um, so from the research side of things, there, there are a couple of issues. Um, one, I, I hesitate to say that there's a dearth of material about the African-American history of Jacksonville specifically, because it's not exactly that there's a dearth, it's um, that it frequently has not been prioritized in terms of collection. So it can be there. Um, and sometimes if you're you know, lucky enough, there is something like, I see someone in the chat mentioned the Clara White Mission, or we mentioned Bethel Baptist or over at Durkeyville, and somebody has done some hard work and kind of coalesced into a little group. But for, for the most part, by and large, the, the trajectory across most of the city's history was to not necessarily care about that material as much. So it might be in somebody's, like as frequently happens at FSCJ with our history, it's in somebody's closet somewhere. Um, so it's not that it doesn't exist, it's that you may not be able to easily locate it um, without a bunch of legwork and a connection in the community to help facilitate uh, that discovery. And then a lot of the material that we do have that comes down to us, even when it is own voices narratives from you know, Black community members in Jacksonville, you frequently have to consider um, how free they felt to speak their actual truth of their experience. So I know that uh, Laura, our host here today, and True run an excellent book club related to their project um, with the Viola newspapers. And one of the conversations that we've had frequently in that group is, you know, when you're looking at something like the WPA narratives that are purportedly, you know, direct slave narratives of people's experiences who lived here in Jacksonville, like, are they actually telling the full truth in those? Were they sort of curating the story that they told based on what they thought that the person who was interviewing them could accept or would be willing to hear or perhaps because they thought that the person interviewing them like had some power to help them out with the federal government. Um, there were some reconstruction court narratives that I read from a KKK, a series of trials about the KKK in Florida in 1872 that was based out of Jacksonville. And a lot of those narratives as well, you know, people didn't always feel comfortable to be as honest as they perhaps might have been were they speaking amongst their own community. So even the written material that does come down to us frequently, um, you have to be aware that they might not have felt comfortable uh, relaying the full truth of their situation. And that's something you so, sort of have to read the gaps for when you're looking at this material as well. Yeah, I will just mention um, one of the resources that has really been lost to history are historically black newspapers um, going back deep into the 20th century, whether that's the Florida metropolis, um, um, the Florida Tatler here in Jacksonville. Um, um, Abel Bartley's book, Keeping the Faith, um, I'm seeing in the chat that yes, we, we, we needed to have a black voice here, but um, Abel Bartley's book along with Rodney Hurst's book um, are books that I use in class. And Abel Bartley's in particular um, in conjunction with Mr. Hurst because Abel Bartley did a substantial job of oral histories um, of Jacksonville civil rights leaders. And that, that testimony um, from those personal experiences, a black historian interviewing black civil rights activist um, really creates an extraordinary narrative of um, Jacksonville's not just civil rights movement, but black political engagement from the 40s to the 70s. Um, and so there are ways to get at black voices that are not kind of conditioned by the context such as the WPA narratives where you have white interviewers conducting the interviews. Um, but it does mean um, 
kind of being creative and how you use your sources. But I would also argue too that this is a call for historians of all backgrounds to really be engaged in doing their own oral history work, getting students involved in that process, um, and sort of creating a foundation for a future generation of historians to tell a story of our city's history from a far more complex um, source of um, a database. One thing that kind of struck my mind as I was hearing Jennifer talk, and I'll, I'll finish with this, is, you know, we, we touched on it maybe at the beginning, and it's oftentimes been a perception of Jacksonville that I think is true to a certain degree, and that is Jacksonville doesn't know its history or historically at a very broad level. There's always been a sense of an identity crisis related to Jacksonville or historical amnesia. And it reminds me of a line, um, there's a book by Rust Reimer called American Beach, it came out a number of years ago, um, about Abraham Lincoln Lewis and his family and, and, and the black community in Jacksonville that, and of course, then the founding of American Beach. But Rust Reimer said, you know, the perception, this is a book for a, a national audience, um, but he said the perception that Jacksonville does not know its history has forgotten its history, Reimer said, and I'm not getting the quote right, but that he said everything that was prominent and rich about Jacksonville's history happened because of Jacksonville's black community. And the, that reality is why Reimer said, and for that reason, you know, Jacksonville has largely forgotten at the collective level. Um, it's its own history because so much of what was rich and prominent happened because of the black community. And so the stories and who got to tell those stories of Jacksonville history throughout its past have largely been white historians, not exclusively, but predominantly. And so that side of Jacksonville history and an important way for Jacksonville to define its identity at the public level has been lost, um, but it can be recovered. And I hope um, through collaboration with community partners and local historians who've been doing this for a very long time, we can begin to turn the tide. If I could pick up, I know we're, we're sort of getting, um, uh, we, we've had a really robust conversation and I wanna make sure we have time uh, for questions. Um, but each of you in various ways have talked about sort of complicating the story of Jacksonville. Um, and I think one of those ways in which we can, we can complicate this story um, is by, or, or, or maybe I can ask, the ways in which um, you engage with the indigenous histories of this area um, and how that shapes uh, the, the way we tell the story of this place. Um. Well, I know for our forthcoming Jacksonville history class, we have really two, we have 12 modules that cover as well as we can a comprehensive history of Northeast Florida and then Duval County and Jacksonville. And the first module as well as the second um, are both about the environmental history, but also the indigenous history of Northeast Florida. And what we're doing here is a couple of things. One, going back to how we're emphasizing the local and the global, um, you know, thanks to the work of Keith Ashley and other scholars at UNF um, and the archeological work that's been done, we're getting a more, a richer picture of how St. John's peoples and then the Tamukwa were not just isolated here in the Southeast portion of our continent, but were connected through trade um, to Mississippian cultures. Um, and so seeing the local and concert and interaction with the rise and fall of indigenous civilizations in the continent is an important theme that Jacksonville is always embedded in larger regional and um, even global um, processes of exchange and trade. The other thing we try to do, and one of the things that is again, building on great secondary scholarship, um, Tamara Spike has written, and as well as other historians about um, the role of gender in Tamukwa society, um, the two spirit or third gender peoples, um, and using, getting students to understand sort of the fluidity of identity and particularly gender identity um, as a something that has a very deep and long history and seeing that play out here um, in Northeast Florida, um, 
particularly to the two-spirit or third gender people is another thing that we're gonna emphasize as well. Um, so again, the local connected to the global through trade, um, and then also emphasizing how our unique environmental context, the unique ecology of Northeast Florida shaped indigenous cultures here is another thing that we'll emphasize too. Uh, the, the narrative of indigenous peoples in local places such as Jacksonville is one that I think has come to emerge much more rapidly and fully in recent years. And for that, we owe a lot to archeologists, uh, anthropologists, historians, uh, scholars such as UNF's Keith Ashley, uh, Denise Bossi, and, and others who have, have been doing such great work at combing that out. Talking about indigenous peoples in representations of the history of a place such as Jacksonville is uh, not just relating that part of the story, but it's, a, it's an opportunity to make more fully authentic the stories of the past that we are telling by making, it, uh, by making it clear and making it present that we are being faithful to the continually emerging record of, of uh, discoveries and increasing widening understanding about the indigenous people, such as the Mokama people of the area uh, here in Northeast Florida. And it's, an, it's also an opportunity to highlight a message that, uh, that I keep trying to drive home, not just in classroom teaching, but in representation of public history more generally. Critics of the discipline of history uh, are, are very prone to say, you know, you can't change history. And by trying to alter the narrative with which they have become familiar, uh, this is a attempt to subvert or take away some aspect of history. And the message that I try to reinforce is that uh, the past is what happened. History really is uh, a phenomenon of the present. It's how we understand, interpret, and explain the past. And what better example of that than the story of indigenous peoples whose past has been invisible or misunderstood or misrepresented for so long, we are continuing to do a better and better job of that. That's the work of history. Uh, and that isn't just related to the history of indigenous peoples. It's the work of history, no matter whose story we're trying to tell. We keep getting better at that. We, yes, we keep revising it. And we will always be about the work of revising it. History is a dynamic uh, area, a dynamic field. That's one of the things that makes it so fascinating and so relevant. All right, um, so we have a little time for questions. We can even, if, if some of you can stay a little bit later, we might run a little over. Um, in the chat or in the, the q and I've got uh, one question here kind of uh, relating to um, events or particular people you'd recommend looking into to get a better, uh, to, to, to get a better idea of Jacksonville's history. I think, uh, we've mentioned a few of them uh, through the conversation, but if there are some specific um, events or individuals that you think highlight some aspect of Jacksonville history or connect it to the larger global themes that, that uh, each of you have um, discussed at some point tonight or this afternoon. Well, I'm personally a big fan of the Patriot Rebellion of 1812. Uh, that one's a fun one that does not get mentioned very much, um, which in short, at the time, Florida was a Spanish colony and the United States low-key sponsored an illegal invasion in the hopes that a group of people could come down, pretend to be Spanish colonists, start an insurrection, and then seize the state and turn it into an American colony. And a lot of the major players in town, Isaiah Hart, uh, Zephaniah Kingsley were involved with that. Um, and it got very messy, very fast, stayed very messy, was a public relations disaster for the United States when it kind of got uncovered, um, even though it was, again, low-key supported by the president at the time. And it's sort of an indicator that was about, you know, 10 years before the city of Jacksonville really coalesced, but it kind of explains the wild west sort of space that was here um, because they 
really destabilized the area for a period of time right around then. And things, even when the Spanish nominally got control back, they didn't really have control of the area. And there were a bunch of people who were previous rebels wandering around the Jacksonville area, just doing whatever they felt like more or less for 10 years. Um, and it kind of explains why things took so long to get started. And then after that, obviously, the Seminole War is another one that we can look at as to why maybe the city took a little longer to really get its footing because of that conflict. I would just mention very briefly, um, one thing we're going to cover as well when we talk about the civil rights movements in Jacksonville, um, we're also going to be looking at the women's movement, um, the Jacksonville women's movement, as they were formerly known. Um, but this is the 50th anniversary of one of the most important Supreme Court cases in the nation's history, but it originated here in Jacksonville and was led by a Jacksonville attorney who is still practicing named Sam Jacobson. Um, in 1972, in a case called Papa Christu versus the city of Jacksonville, Jacobson um, represented a um, handful of Jacksonville citizens um, in a case that eventually overturns vagrancy laws across the country. Um, University of Virginia law professor um, named Risa Gubeloff argues that uh, Papa Christu is up there with Brown versus the Board of Education as other, in other 20th century court cases as momentous um, redefinitions of rights of individuals. Um, and so that's a case that is largely forgotten. Um, it's telling that in the 50th anniversary, there's been no discussion of it. Um, Jacobson is a very humble, understated person who does not like to toot his own horn at all. Um, but that would be an example of something that I think we need greater awareness of because it gets to the heart of race. Um, Papa Christu, Elaine Papa Christu was in a car with two black men um, and another white woman two men were students, I believe, Jennifer at FSCJ. Okay, so you're contractually obligated to mention yes. the fact that this case involved FSCJ students. So it was about vagrancy and vagrancy laws and how vagrancy laws um, had ancient histories and were used for, by the police to randomly and arbitrarily arrest people, but that had specifically racial connotations and, and implications. Um, and so I think that's a case that we need to talk more about, about and its significance to Jacksonville history. And, and the lawyer, Sam Jacobson, um, is an incredible figure too. Well, I think the question was to suggest uh, other African-Americans in Jacksonville's history that students might uh, particularly attend to. Did I hear that correctly, David? Uh, it was a broader question than that, but if you have, uh, if you want to make it more focused, uh, I invite you to do that. The question was really any events or people we'd recommend, um, but you, you can certainly choose how, how you wish to answer that. Okay, well, it, it's, a, it's a combination of events and individuals. Uh, I think my colleagues on the call are familiar with the figure known as Mother Kofi. Is that uh, familiar to both of you? So Mother Kofi was an African-American woman whose background is uh, still really not very, not crystal clear. She is represented in some accounts as having actually been a princess, a native of one of the Western African uh, states who immigrated to the United States and became associated with Marcus Garvey's movement, the United Negro Improvement Association, which was a, a vibrant, uh, a black nationalist organization that achieved primacy in the late teens and the 1920s and then came unraveled owing to some economic uh, pressures, some weakness in the business model that Mr. Garvey adopted, as well, frankly, as a pretty explicit subversion on the part of the United States federal government through the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The whole Marcus Garvey story is, is a fascinating a thread in American civil rights history. It's, it's testimony to the ways that uh, African Americans tried to navigate their way through the resistance to uh, social justice and equality. Uh, Mother Kofi's story is a part of that. She became an ardent advocate and, and shared in uh, Mr. Garvey's voice in advocating uh, for black nationalism. Her story also evokes the, uh, the gender tensions in not just the UNIA, but in uh, civil rights history more generally. And scholars in civil rights history have, uh, have done a great job of combing that out. 
in the history of the movement through the 1960s. Well, Mother Kofi died violently at the hands of an assassin while she was on a speaking tour in Miami. She lived in Jacksonville. I believe her, her, the home she lived in still stands on the east side of Jacksonville. There's been a little bit of ambiguity about exactly which house it was, but you may visit her uh, at her permanent resting place in the Jacksonville City Cemetery on the east side. And to connect with that story is a remarkable way to catch a glimpse of some of the fabulous complexities of that aspect of not just Jacksonville's story, uh, but civil rights history more generally, so. Thank you. Um, we had one more question um, and this, um, is probably I, in some ways it's 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 more directed towards me in in one aspect of it. The question is, what are the future plans at Edward Waters University? Um, and we don't have anyone here from Edward Waters right now. Um, UNF, FSCJ, uh, etc., to expand the course offering and um, and professional training in public history. Um, I don't. Maybe I, I'll put it to, at, at FSCJ. Do you offer courses that introduce students to some of this kind of, of uh, historical labor? We don't have any specific public history courses. Um, although I think the Jacksonville history course offers a chance and we would like to and partner with Alan and the JHS to get some of our students involved um, in who are taking the course involved working as volunteers at, at various historical societies or archives. Um, and we tell them about, in the course of teaching Jacksonville history, how the city tells its history and has taught its history. But in terms of a kind of public, have, public history as a methodology, um, as, a, as a practice, um, no, that, that, that's something we don't have um, on offer. Um, at UNF, um, we, we offer, uh, fairly regularly courses that do relate to public history. Um, there's conversations about the possible development of a more formalized program, but those are early stages of the conversation. Um, we have courses like uh, Dr. Bevel's Blackness and Archives that are right now. Um, the, we have uh, students at the undergrad, the senior undergraduate graduate level. Um, they're working um, on a project, it's it's not quite Jacksonville, but it's close and, and very closely connected in Waycross, Georgia. Uh, there's an African American cemetery in Waycross, Georgia, um, that um, we've been working on uh, for a few years now, and she's made kind of the center of her project. Um, and and we also offer um, courses uh, more directly engaged with um, the practice of public history. And as I said, there's some conversation about. Um, formalizing that into um, a, a program uh, that would um, uh, provide sort of broader education in, in both the, the sort of theory and, then, and practice of public history. I don't know, Alan, do you have anything to add on uh, Jacksonville Historical Society's connections to some of these kinds of projects? Well, I'm certainly, strongly supportive, as David knows, of the efforts to incorporate public history into the curriculum at UNF in the department uh, uh, where I have so many cherished relationships. And also, uh, it's not my place to speak for Edward Waters uh, University, but I do want to give them a shout out. Uh, one of their, uh, their history faculty member, David Jamison. Uh, Dr. Jamison is a member of our board of directors at the Jacksonville Historical Society. And I know that he has been deeply engaged with the Community Remembrance Project, as, as has Dr. Matthews, and uh, has really, in the five or six years that he has been in Jacksonville, really embraced this city and its history and is an advocate uh, for, for the work that we've been talking about here today. And also, I want to compliment them for sharing a couple of Edward Waters University students for a presentation that the Historical Society hosted in February, one of our two Black History Month presentations was on the history of Jacksonville's first Black attorney, uh, Judge Joseph E. Lee. And uh, that was a great example of research and representation done by university students uh, who were engaging with primary resources here at the Jacksonville Historical Society and elsewhere. Uh, that, that 
program uh, was, uh, was co-led and co-presented by one of their faculty members from the criminology department, an attorney named E.K. Ehrlich, and also co-led by uh, U.S. Federal Judge Brian Davis. Uh, it's, it speaks to uh, the breadth, I think, of uh, Edward Waters' engagement, and I, I really want to voice support and encouragement for more work like that not just from them, uh, but from all of our local institutions and schools. Well, thank you all. I, I think we've kind of come to the end of, of the time here. I think that's a good note to, to end on actually. Um, a kind of hopeful note and, uh, and a call for continued work in this area. I wanna thank all the panelists and um, uh, all of the people who at attended today, we had, uh, I think at one point we had up to 28 um, attendees. So um, I think that's, that's a pretty good um, group for an afternoon on a, on a Wednesday. So, uh, oh, a new message. Let's see. Uh, is this some thank yous? Ah, okay. Um, yeah. Anyway, so, all right. Um, I don't know if Laura comes back or if we. We're just walking a line into the sunset together. That's how this ends. Well, is this how this ends? <laughs> That's the, how we the, end. Link arms, the walking awkward, into the sunset. The awkward Zoom ending is always good. Okay. <laughs> Um, all right, so thank you all for attending and um, I want to thank each of the panelists and I want to thank Dr. Heffernan uh, for um, putting this together. Thank you all so much. Thanks to everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.